I also understand that uh, like the goal of NASA might be to justify its existence for its parts, but I also understand that uh, if you those use this logic, then you probably right, try to convince that your existence uh, should be continued. That's, that's, that is something I, I understand. But uh, I was wondering whether you ever, ever thought about it in a different way, that NASA tries to present itself as a guarantor against instability that it, it, it has created. Basically, uh, when, uh, for example, when Russia or USSR or whatever, like this band is Warsaw Pact, you unilaterally you know, removed the troops from uh, Eastern Europe and said, like, guys, let's live in peace together. Let's create one Europe from this amount of war and stuff. It's like, it was a bit of a, what Gorbachev said, Putin said, and Medvedev said. But it's, it's like the result of that was that, like, the, just through the expansion. And if Russia has, like, seven bases outside of Russia, and NATO has, just like, all the allies have 800 bases, what kind of aggression we're talking about? It's like, of course, uh, the ammunition that was created for the sole purpose of destroying, or how we call it, like defending from the outside, uh, it's like the USSR, of course it would be scared away. And of course you provoke, of course you create some kind of tension, of course you create some kind of instability in the region, and you need somehow to respond to it. If you say like, I will come, I'm a Captain America, and I will save you, save you from something that maybe we can move to a different equilibrium at which uh, like there is no tension from the side and we all trust each other and there is more maybe if we're even more stability to our world then that just motivate us to donate even more or like support that even more than our will we'll find money, we will we'll find money. So I know it will continue on and on. It's like it's not the um, it's, it will not resolve our issues in this way. I was ever thought I have I was wondering whether you ever thought about it in this way. Or for you, it's a settled question. It's like you just have a, some kind of a, like uh, schedule, some kind of uh, goal in mind that you need to achieve, and you it's like yeah. it, I'm talking about the other one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> NATO do not uh, seek confrontation with uh, uh, does not seek confrontation with uh, with Russia. Uh, actually, NATO uh, strives for a more cooperative and constructive relationship with Russia, and uh, we believe that uh, we should uh, try to develop uh, political dialogue with Russia, that we should uh, uh, try to keep tensions down, that we should do whatever we can to pro provide uh, to prevent the new arms race, and uh, actually after the end of the Cold War. Uh, NATO invited Russia into a broad partnership and we were able to establish a lot of cooperation with Russia. And I think we moved step by step in the right direction. Um, but then we have to understand what happened is that Russia partly continued a very substantial military buildup. Since 2000, Russia has tripled defense spending in real terms. But not only, and at the same time, we reduced defense spending every year. But not only has Russia tripled defense spending, uh, invested in many modern um, military capabilities, exercised their forces in a more aggressive pattern and ways. But the most important thing is that Russia used military force against neighbors. Against Georgia. They violated the international recognized borders of Georgia. Russia has uh, military troops in Moldova against the wish of the government of Moldova. And then the last example, which is perhaps also the most serious example, is that they annexed Crimea, despite that they have signed an agreement recognizing Crimea as part of Ukraine. And they used military force to achieve that goal. And then they have continued to destabilize Eastern Ukraine, uh, supporting the uh, uh, separatists. So if NATO hadn't reacted to that, then NATO wouldn't have served this main so, purpose, which is to provide defense and deterrence for all allies, including, for instance, the Baltic countries 
which feel that it's really a serious situation when Russia used military force against neighbors, uh, which has been part of the Soviet Union, which has also been the case for these Baltic countries. Uh, I say this because, because I believe that NATO has to be strong. We have to provide deterrence. We have to uh, stand united, not to provoke a war, but to prevent the war. And this has been very successful for 70 years. And, uh, and, uh, and we have seen peace and stability in Europe for many reasons, but one reason is that NATO has been there uh, uh, making sure to have stability and security uh, for our uh, uh, allies. Um, yeah, uh, I can say more about Russia, but I will just end by saying that I will continue to work for dialogue with Russia, and I, and I believe that there is no contradiction between strong defense and dialogue. I actually believe that as long as NATO is strong, as long as we stand together and we, and we provide deterrence, you can also engage in dialogue with Russia. Uh, and I don't believe we should try to isolate Russia. I believe that Russia is, uh, not only believe, but Russia is our biggest neighbor, it's there to stay. So we have to develop a relationship with Russia and try to reduce tensions as much as possible. My name is Andrew McClure, and I'm a student uh, here in the MPA degree program. So my question is uh, about Turkey today. When you look at Turkey uh, following the coup this summer, um, what do you make of that country's increasing uh, slide away from democratic principles and increasing authoritarian bent? What sort of message uh, would you relay let me start by underlining the importance of Turkey uh, as a NATO ally. Turkey is a highly valued and <coughs> essential ally for NATO for several reasons. One obvious reason is the geographic location of Turkey. Uh, being so close to much of the turmoil, the instability and the challenges uh, NATO is facing. Turkey is a country bordering the Black Sea, close to Crimea, Ukraine and the instability to the north of Turkey. They are bordering Georgia, where we have instability, and Russia is present with forces uh, in, uh, in uh, two uh, regions of Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And then, of course, Turkey is bordering Iraq and Syria. So Turkey is by far the NATO ally most affected by the instability, the violence, and the terrorist threats coming from ISIL. And they have hosted or they are hosting around 3 million refugees. <coughs> and Turkey plays a key role in the fight against ISIL, partly because they contribute themselves with their own forces, their own capabilities in the fight against ISIL, but also, of course, because Turkey provides the basis uh, infrastructure for other NATO allies uh, to uh, conduct airstrikes and operations against ISIL. So I think to just imagine a NATO without Turkey would just really underline uh, how dangerous that will be and how close much of the turmoil and the violence we see in the Middle East will come uh, even closer to the heart of, uh, of Europe. So Turkey is important for NATO, uh, uh, not least uh, uh, confronting and standing up against all the turmoil and violence we see uh, in the South. The coup attempt was an attempt uh, to overthrow a democratic elected government uh, they bombed uh, the presidential palace, they bombed the, uh, the, the parliament, and I visited the parliament just a couple of weeks ago, and, it, and it's quite a strong impression to be there in the parliament and to see the main assembly hall, and just outside that hall you see the damage caused by the F-16 or bombs from, from, from the F-16 uh, fighter jets bombing the parliament. And it's hard to imagine any stronger expression of disrespect for de democracy than using military power against the elected parliament with the parliamentarians inside. So, of course, Na Turkey has the right to protect itself. Uh, Turkey has the right to protect itself against terrorist attacks. Uh, they have suffered many terrorist attacks. And, of course, uh, Turkey has the right to also to prosecute uh, those uh, behind the uh, failed uh, uh, coup. Uh, I'm confident, and I have discussed this with the Turkish leaders, 
that uh, when they uh, prosecute those responsible, uh, that the principles of uh, individual liberty, the rule of law, uh, democratic values uh, should be uh, respected because that's core values for NATO and I personally also attach great importance to those uh, values. The crisis in Syria is uh, really, really um, uh, appalling and it's, and it's so uh, heartbreaking to see all the civilians uh, that uh, suffer. And every time we think it cannot get worse, it becomes even worse. And the latest example is the example you refer to, the bombing of a uh, aid convoy uh, with aid to aid and help to uh, civilians and uh, uh, the killing of them, uh, many aid workers. This is morally totally unacceptable and it's a blatant violation of basic international uh, law. For me that just underlines the importance of uh, continuing to support all efforts to try to find a political negotiated solution. I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not saying that we have not tried before and failed, but uh, there is, in the long run, there is no other way. Uh, so we uh, would just continue to support the efforts of uh, the UN, of the United States and others to try to at least agree on a, a ceasefire which is respected and uh, 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 unhindered access, safe access of uh, aid to, uh, uh, to civilians. Um, NATO supports the uh, US-led coalition fighting ISIL. We support them in different ways, but uh, especially now with uh, AWACS surveillance planes, helping them to have a better picture of the airspace over Syria. And all NATO allies participate in different ways. Several NATO allies also conduct the airstrikes. And of course, for the efficiency or for the, uh, you know, the impact of the, of, of the uh, uh, efforts of the alliance, it is a great advantage that, that they have developed a lot of interoperability, the ability to work together, to communicate, to understand each other, to have this kind of advanced military operations uh, based on NATO exercises, NATO standards, and just experience from other uh, operations in Afghanistan or in Libya or uh, elsewhere. But NATO is not on the ground in Syria. And therefore, I've been always careful going into the operational <coughs> details or different uh, questions related to exactly how to conduct uh, uh, the military operations in uh, Syria. Uh, I will leave that to the US-led uh, coalition. Uh, and, but we, I think we all have to understand that a no-fly zone uh, can create a very challenging situation and uh, that's also the reason why there has been some reluctance to establish a no-fly zone because then it also has to be uh, implemented and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, as I say, fully respected, which uh, can be a quite demanding situation to uh, put our, uh, also to put the, the, the forces in the area uh, into. So uh, uh, we will continue to support the UN-led peace process uh, we will continue to support the uh, uh, US-led uh, coalition to fight ISIL, but NATO will not be present uh, with military forces inside uh, Syria under NATO command. Yes, I'll be back. I'm 
My name is uh, Greg Allen. I'm a dual degree student uh, here at Kennedy School and Harvard Business School. Um, we just the Harvard Kennedy School very recently hosted the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Robert Work, who gave a presentation wherein he uh, listed some very interesting facts. Uh, first, he said that the Russian military and the Chinese military have reached or will soon reach parity in guided munitions uh, with the Western Alliance. Uh, second, he said the future of the United States and Western military superiority will be based on the effective incorporation of artificial intelligence technologies into military strategy. We are expecting that by 2030, 30% of their armed forces will be needed uh, to be the form of robotic weapons. So I'm curious, what is uh, NATO's strategy for the incorporation of robotics and artificial intelligence? Uh Robert work uh, and uh, uh, his assessments of what kind of what to say the importance of technology and uh, the importance of uh, uh, different kinds of uh, even more advanced weapon systems than we have today has been something which we have discussed a lot at NATO. He actually visited the North Atlantic Council and perhaps he didn't give exactly the same presentation but at least addressed the same issues and uh, I think that uh, he, the message from him is that we have always had a technological edge or advantage compared to our uh, to other nations uh, in 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 the world. We have to keep that edge. We have to uh, continue to develop our our uh, also different uh, capabilities and technologies. And that's exactly one of the reasons why we also have to invest more in defense, because this requires investments in research and development. And it requires uh, that we work together, so we also get more out of uh, our investments when we uh, do it together. And it also requires uh, an understanding that I think that open societies like uh, NATO uh, countries, they have a big advantage that uh, we, will, we are better able to utilize some of these technologies. A lot of networks, a lot of... Uh, a lot of, for instance, the development of different kinds of artificial technology, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, is something which we have uh, the advantage of uh, applying because we have many more people who are uh, utilizing and using these kind of technologies for, for peaceful uh, uh, purposes already uh, today. So the, the thing is that we have to stay focused, we have to invest in uh, technology, uh, research, to be able to keep the technological edge also in the future. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, Mike's coming right behind you. Thank you, President. Thank you, Secretary General. My name is Nidhi Vinaya. I'm a um, first, second year Kennedy School student, actually, currently. And thank you for coming to our class this morning. It's great. <laughs> My question's about regional alliances that we've touched upon briefly. Um, what is NATO doing in its to further facilitate regional um, alliances and showing leadership so that um, other regional alliances altogether have the capability and the power to influence regional decision making. I think the most important thing NATO does is that we work together with partners uh, all over the world actually, but uh, especially in uh, our neighborhood. Uh, and it's not always about regional alliances, but it's more about working with different partner nations uh, uh, in our uh, vicinity or, or our uh, neighborhood. And meaning, for instance, that we have something called the Mediterranean Dialogue, uh, which is uh, the, also the countries in North Africa and the Middle East, including Israel. And we sit down with them and we discuss common challenges, common, uh, uh, to say, uh, tasks which we uh, address together, uh, everything from fighting terrorism to stabilize the region. And, and I believe very much in this partnership concept because that's a way of trying uh, to uh, project stability or to stabilize our neighborhood uh, based on the idea that if our neighborhood is stable, we are more secure. Uh, and that's everything from a political dialogue uh, to, for instance, training and helping Tunisia uh, to develop their uh, special operation forces and intelligence. So it's less about regional alliances, more about regional cooperation between NATO and different countries in different regions, especially in our neighborhood. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Victor Hugo Ruiz. I'm a student of, at the MPIT. 
And my question is, uh, considering that there has been this evolution of tax tactics that might be considered as popping, you know, the so-called hybrid work, how do you redefine the criteria for activating um, Article 5 so as to maintain NATO's credibility? And I'm thinking particularly about, for example, the case of a small country, small NATO member country, and small destabilizing um, actions in which um, some of the other members might not have the incentives to activate the article. The fundamental task for NATO, the core task for NATO, is to protect all allies against any threat. And uh, we have been able to do so for close to 70 years. Uh, and uh, that applies for both big and small allies. Uh, and, and there has to be, and, and, and the important thing is that there is no, there, there, there is no doubt about that. Uh, because the important thing with deterrence is that as long as deterrence is credible, as long as deterrence is, 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 is real, then we prevent the war. Uh, and that's the best thing, to never really be able, or never, uh, to never be forced to use military force, because if you are strong, uh, you uh, prevent uh, uh, anyone from trying to test your capabilities. Then you are pointing out something which is a, a, a challenge. And that is, during the Cold War, the idea of an attack was, in a way, uh, armored vehicles or uh, battle tanks from the Soviet Union rolling over the uh, border between East and West Germany, and there was no doubt when the war started. The problem with hybrid warfare is it's much more difficult to define exactly when it starts and actually uh, whether you are under attack or who is behind the attack. Uh, because hybrid warfare is, is this combination of civil and military means of aggression. It's uh, this combination of uh, overt and covert operations. It's uh, cyber. Uh, one of the big problems with cyber attacks is of course that you can be under attack but you don't know who is attacking you and so on. So we have to adapt. Meaning for instance that we have to uh, develop our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. So we have a better picture, better understanding, that we are more able to see what's going on on the ground. Uh, and that's exactly what we are doing. We are developing uh, our intelligence capabilities. Uh, we, are, we, have now invest, we are now soon to deploy a new uh, system of drones uh, to be able to have a better picture uh, on the ground uh, if anything uh, happens. Um, uh, we need to be able to react fast because with hybrid warfare there is less warning time. That's the reason why we are increasing the readiness of our forces, why we have tripled the size of the NATO response force so we can also f quickly deploy forces if needed. And also one of the reasons why we have decided to have forces uh, uh, deployed in the three Baltic con uh, countries and Poland augmenting or increasing their cap capabilities to respond if there is uh, an attack in a, uh, of, of any sort uh, against one of uh, these uh, countries. Uh, so uh, we are adapting to a, a security environment where the threats are less easy to identify and an attack is less easy or uh, more, more, more difficult uh, to, uh, to, to define. Uh, but, you know, hybrid attacks are often just, in a way, the first step, the prelude to a bigger conventional attack. Uh, and uh, part of that is cyber, and uh, we are really stepping up the efforts to defend our cyber networks. Uh, we have defined cyber as a, a military domain. Also we have sea, land, air, and cyber. Uh, all of this to enable us to respond to different kinds of uh, threats. The last thing is that, uh, is that the, the Article 5 is, is, is something which applies, as I said, for all countries. There can be no doubt about that. Uh, and, and NATO will live up to the guarantees we have uh, provided.
But I think more important for our students uh, is a short history of faith, changes in politics, all kinds of things. It was about 40 years ago that a man by the name of Johann Holtz, who became the head of the Oslo Peace Accord, called me and said, uh, I'd like to bring a friend to meet you. I said, come on over to my house. I can assure you, 40 years ago, I was a very, very junior member of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And Johann Holtz arrived with this man, and his name is Torvald Schwarzenberg, <laughs> and the father of friends. Mm -hmm. And it looked as if he was going to be out of political office. And Johann was looking for a job for your father. And he said, <laughs> He did not tell me he was your uncle at that point. I yeah. never found out many years later. But this is what is so fascinating about politics and the way the world changes. Torvald was about to be voted out of office. The party was going. But the elections changed, and he won. And he became Minister of Defense, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, later in life, the ambassador to Denmark, the head of everything in and, uh, yeah, Ambassador Denmark, the head of everything in Norway today. I saw him in June. Mm. And oh, out of those chance meetings is where your life really changes. Beginning with meeting him then, I began to work with him in the National Academy of Sciences on Energy Wales, on energy, nuclear power. And again, it's so much that you never anticipate. So uh, that old phrase, seize the day. Mm. And your mother, who should not go unmentioned here, was the leading, <laughs> the leading feminist in Norway, cabinet post, major policy decisions, and bringing about major social change in Norway. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, I want to know about NATO expansion, yeah. because yeah. I voted against it once. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you for the nice words about my family. And, uh, <laughs> and you actually know almost more about my family than I do myself. Uh, and, I, and I phone my father every day. So I will phone him now when I go into the car on my way to the airport, and then I'll tell that uh, I met you. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, Johan Jürgen Holstein was my uncle. Uh, and uh, uh, Norway, uh, so Norway is a small country, but... Uh, <laughs> But not, we are not all in family, so uh, <laughs> there are at least uh, some families. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, then, uh, then about expansion. Uh, well, uh, it, it has been debated all the time, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, some allies have been skeptical, uh, yeah, almost, so, and some all, all has, uh, have, have also been against some of the rounds of enlargement. But at the end, we have always agreed. Because the only way NATO can enlarge is by consensus. So at the end, all allies have to agree to invite a new ally. Uh, and, uh, and I believe that even if there are, or even if there have always been, you know, pro and cons, I really believe that um, uh, the overall message is that uh, it has been a great success because it has contributed to stability, uh, to a Europe uh, more whole, uh, uh, free and at peace. And, of course, for those countries that, uh, for, for many of them, they have, they lived for s decades uh, under, uh, also under, the Soviet, uh, under the rule of the Soviet Union, either as part of the Soviet Union or as a republic in the Soviet Union and or a part of the Warsaw Pact. So for them to be able to join NATO was in a way a way to make sure that they can remain free, uh, independent, uh, with the protection of NATO. And I sometimes use the word expansion uh, because that's how it's often referred to. But expansion is more like, in a way, NATO moving east, so taking in Poland and, Bol and, and Lithuania and, and Estonia and so on. But the reality is that it's more that the East has moved West, meaning that those nations, the Baltic nations, Poland, Hungary, and so on, and all the other uh, new allies, they have strongly asked for uh, 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 
the, the, the possibility to become mem members. And they have decided so by democratic decisions in their own countries. It's not NATO grabbing land. It's the land that <laughs> moves into NATO in a way. And that's a big difference because, because this is uh, not an aggressive policy of NATO, but it's to respect the free independent choice of free independent nations, uh, including that they have, to, they have the right to decide their own path and what kind of security arrangements they want to be part of, including the military alliance as NATO. Thank you, Secretary General. My name is Thomas Roger. I'm a second year MBA student at Kennedy School. Um, my question is on NATO and Israel. So in uh, May 2016, NATO allowed Israel to open the Quran Commission to its headquarters in Brussels. Um, it was mostly, you know, talk about this sort of a rather symbolic, uh, strategically substantive move. Um, but it certainly offers more opportunities for co cooperation. And now I was wondering, many Israelis still seem to be very skeptical um, Former Prime Minister Yehud Barak was here at the Kennedy School, spoke here at the Kennedy School a few days ago, and he said, and I quote, um, NATO is hollow, everybody knows this except the leaders of NATO. Um, now my question is, you know, why would you say this? How would you respond to this? And secondly, what are NATO's or your personal objectives um, or priorities with regard to Israel and NATO? So f first of all, I, I think it's good that uh, NATO uh, has been able to develop partnership to many different countries. Uh, and that's a way we work with countries, cooperate with them. And, some of, and many of our partners, they actually contribute and are part of NATO operations and missions. Uh, so NATO has been in Afghanistan for many years. But we have to remember that many of the soldiers that NATO has deployed there, they're not coming from NATO allied countries, but they're coming from partner nations. For instance, Georgia has been one of the major force contributors to NATO, uh, contributors to, to NATO's presence in, in Afghanistan and, uh, and so on. Jordan has participated and so on. Uh, uh, so I think that the partnerships are important for NATO and for the partner nations. We welcome the partnership with, uh, with Israel and I'm proud that we were able to then make it possible for Israel to open the mission. It's some kind of well, it's kind of symbolic uh, thing, but I think it is important that NATO, as an alliance, 28 allies, have said, yes, we would like to have Israel with a diplomatic mission to NATO. It's a strong political signal. And politics is also about symbols and signals, and this is a strong signal. And it also facilitates some practical cooperation. We can now move further with different kinds of practical uh, programs, some, something called the Individual Partnership Program, which we now can develop with, with Israel. Benefit for NATO, benefit for Israel. I, I didn't get exactly who said that NATO was hollow, but, but well, okay, he's actually a friend, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, yeah. and he's a good man, but, uh, but uh, and a labor politician. So, but, uh, but, 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 but the thing is that, I don't know exactly why he said that, but what I know is that we are the strongest military alliance in the world, and we provide deterrence every day. And we have been there for 70 years, or close to 70 years, deterring the, the old Soviet Union. And I think that if you go to Afghanistan, you have seen NATO presence there with more than 100,000 troops, providing security, training local forces. We are there today. And if you ask the Afghans whether we are hollow, they will not understand uh, because we are there, we help them, we train them, we advise them, and we uh, help them to fight Taliban and to protect them against, you know, all the violence and all the intolerance that Taliban uh, and the other terrorist groups in Afghanistan represents. If you go, if you go to Bosnia, uh, they were, so they have started genocide. At least it was, they killed each other. It was war. NATO troops went in and we stopped it. Um, uh, if you. If you, Kosovo, 5,000 NATO soldiers contributing to stability in, in Kosovo. And if you go to Latvia, Lithuania, or uh, Estonia, they, they, they will now see that NATO troops are coming there, they stand there, and, they, and the important thing with the NATO presence in these countries is not that the battle group or battalion is so big, but the thing is that the NATO battalion in Estonia is going to be uh, it's going to consist of 
uh, forces troops from many different NATO allied countries, signaling very clearly that if, if, if Estonia is attacked, it will trigger a response from the whole alliance. So the multinational presence of NATO troops in, uh, for instance, Estonia sends an extreme strong signal that Estonia will not be left alone, but it will immediately trigger the response from the whole alliance. So for them, this is not hollow. Uh, why it's hollow for uh, uh, Barak, I don't know, but um, that doesn't matter so much. Matt. <laughs> mm. uh, Central Asia um, is still important for NATO and we have many partner nations in the region. Uh, but you uh, are right that, of course, um, because we are now reducing our presence, or we have already reduced our presence in Afghanistan, uh, the importance of Central Asia, at least for the operations in Afghanistan, has been uh, significantly reduced. Because before we had many bases, at least we had bases there and we had troops there, not because, because there was a, uh, uh, as a, um, a way into Afghanistan. Uh, we, 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 at the top, we had close to 140,000 troops and we conducted big military combat operations in Afghanistan. Now we have reduced that to 12, oh, close to 13,000, uh, 12,800 troops and they don't participate in combat operations anymore. What they do is to train, assist and advise the Afghan forces. So it's a completely different world. And I think it's a very good thing that NATO has ended the combat operations and that we have enabled the Afghans themselves to protect their own country. And I really believe that in the long run it's much better that, than NATO deploying combat forces, that we enable local forces to protect themselves and to stabilize their own countries. So therefore also our presence in, 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 in Central Asia and Uzbekistan has been reduced also to, in many, many, many cases to zero uh, because we don't need it for military purposes inside Afghanistan anymore. We have time maybe for two more questions. So we will go right in the back. Yes, great. Uh, thank you for coming to Mr. Sir. My name is Ali and I'm MPA1 at the Kennedy School. I have a question that uh, there's a lot of conversation around ISIL. And Syria right now is being used as a playground by Iran and Saudi Arabia. Both these countries are regional players, regional powerhouses. They have their strategic objectives. What do you think NATO can do in terms of reconciling the strategic objectives of both Iran Saudi Arabia? And then is there a way that NATO can bring these two powers to the table and create some sort of a peaceful, workable solution uh, in the short term? Thank you. <clears throat> I recently visited the Gulf region uh, and I met, uh, met also with the conference of, the, of Saudi Arabia uh, recently in Brussels. And uh, one of the things I really have uh, learned a lot more about since I became Secretary General is the complexity and the challenges uh, in the whole region. Uh, the Gulf region, Iran, uh, also affecting of course the turmoil, the violence in countries like uh, Iraq and, uh, and Syria. And I think it is important to be realistic uh, that uh, of course NATO can play a role, NATO can contribute uh, in many different ways, but NATO cannot solve all problems. So NATO is is part of the answer to many problems, but, but we are not the only answer to all problems. Uh, meaning that, uh, that uh, 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 to, for instance, solve the, or to reconcile the tensions, the, 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 uh, the uh, problems we see uh, between uh, Saudi Arabia and, uh, and uh, Iran is not an easy task. Uh, and I don't believe that NATO can just go in and solve it. That's actually not for NATO uh, to do. 
But what I think is that NATO can, uh, through our uh, cooperation, for instance, with the Gulf states, uh, our dialogue with the different states in the region, can at least help contribute to reduce tensions. And we can, of course, contribute to the fight against ISIL. And I've stated uh, several times what we are doing. We, we train uh, local forces, especially in uh, Iraq. Uh, we work with other countries in the region. I mentioned especially Jordan and Tunisia. We have a very close cooperation with uh, several states in the Gulf region. We will later on this fall open a new NATO regional training center in Kuwait. Uh, which will be some kind of yeah, hub for partnership, for political dialogue and for training uh, in the region. Uh, and of course, we, even if the, yeah, we work with Turkey, uh, which is bordering and very close to all the turmoil and the violence in Syria and Iraq. But, but, but you know, the extreme difficult relationship uh, or the, the different complex relationships in, in the Middle East uh, it's not for NATO just to solve, uh, but we can help, uh, contribute, and that's exactly what we are uh, doing. Thank you. I have a question right here. Um, thank you, Secretary General, for coming. Uh, my name is Artyom. I'm a prosecutor in the symptomatic that there are two Russians in the room. We started with the Q&A question. Uh, Q&A session with the Russian and that is the Russian. But uh, my question is not actually uh, concerning Russia. I'm more interested in NATO policy in another region in Asia, because uh, there are a lot of partners that NATO has in Asia, such as Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Thailand. So in case there is a conflict in South China Sea specifically, uh, what is your opinion? How, how engaged should NATO be to envision any, any possible uh, NATO policy in that region? NATO has many partners all, all over the world, including uh, Japan, uh, Korea, and others. And, uh, and we have political dialogue with them. Um, they participate, contribute to some of our operations. South Korea and Japan uh, also contribute financially to, uh, for instance, uh, our activities in, uh, in Afghanistan, and so on. And I, uh, so, so they are partners. But I think we have to distinguish very clearly between partners and members meaning that the NATO collective defense security guarantees, an attack on one is an attack on all, uh, applies for the members and members only. Meaning that NATO do not have any security guarantees that covers the South China Sea. Uh, uh, that's, we are a regional, we are a regional organization uh, uh, which covers Europe and uh, North America, Canada and the United States. Um, uh, the important thing in the South China Sea is that the, uh, is that the conflicts, the, the disagreements there are resolved according to the international, uh, in, in international law and the law of the sea. Uh, and we support all efforts to try to find you know, uh, ways to resolve the, uh, the disputes by uh, applying uh, international law. But for NATO it's not an issue to have any guarantees or any military presence. Uh, it may be NATO allies, not the United States is present in the, in the Pacific and, the, and in that region, but that's as, as an individual nation, not, as, not, not on behalf of uh, NATO. So the short answer is that NATO has a close partnership with countries in Asia, but we don't have any security guarantees which applies for Asia.